So I'm going to uh, begin by uh, introducing my colleague, Reverend Graylin Scott Hagler, uh, who I am so excited to have join this conversation. So excited to have him be a part of FOR. Um, Graylin came on to FOR right around the same time that I did. And uh, prior to that, prior to the summer of 2022, uh, he, he was senior minister at Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ in Washington, DC, um, an area that he had been a major part of helping transform from corner, li corner liquor stores and open air drug markets to one that's engaged in uplifting uh, community. He, con he continues to stay involved uh, in that congregation, uh, which he spent so many years inspiring. And, uh, but he has joined uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation as our senior advisor to help inspire and assist in our um, work for racial and economic and social justice. And with that, I'm gonna hand it to Graylin to introduce our guest. Well, thank you, Ariel. And it's just good to be a part of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and also greet all of you who are on here with us today. And um, we have some time of some very exciting discussion because particularly over the last few years, we've been rocked and we've been reeling from different episodes of police violence and extrajudicial killings, police brutality, and people are left wondering what can be done? How can we reshape the discussion? How can we get a handle on the situation? And we're bringing before us today, Brother Ronald Hampton, who is a retired DC Metropolitan Police Officer with over 23 years of experience on the force. He brings extensive background in terms of education and training. And I need to just say that I first met Brother Hampton back in 1982, 1983. I was on trial in Boston under charges of assault on a police officer and a number of other things. And um, it was a time in which police conduct in Boston was at this place of of almost epidemic proportion. And we formed the group to try to keep me out of jail called uh, Clergy and Citizens for Justice. And our biggest obstacle was how to talk about law enforcement and be able to have a credible discussion so that people do not line up on one side or another, but can really use the capacity of their brain to decipher the issue. And we brought Ron up from Washington, DC to speak. And Lawrence O'Donnell Jr. was a part of our group for he was representing a case of James Bowden who had been killed by Boston police. And the family was suing and had won the lawsuit and the city was refusing to pay the family for the killing of James Bowden. And Ron helped to create a sober atmosphere so that we were able to have a discussion about police conduct and misconduct. Ron comes to us with extensive experience, having served as the executive director of the National Black Police Association, and also as the executive director of the National Black Police Association. He currently served in a number of capacities, educating and training people around law enforcement. So Ron will tell you a little bit more about that. But I was caught as part of uh, the Institute of the Black World that held its convention in Baltimore this past summer. Ron, you said something like, the current destructive death dealing system that 
that is suppressing, oppressing, brutalizing, and killing black people must be abolished. Can you tell us what you meant by that? Uh, first of all, let me let me say good evening to everyone and also uh, thank you, especially uh, 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 Reverend Hagler for uh, those kind words, uh, the work uh, that, that I've been involved in for all these years so, uh, has been, um, I, 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 I have to say that the work has been interesting in the sense that it is what I think my mother would have wanted for me. My mother um, was very influential in my life in terms of setting my values and uh, uh, and how to how to present. And uh, I'm just doing what it is that I think she would have wanted me to do. Uh, she's deceased now, her and my father, but I just think I'm, I'm doing exactly what it is that she would want me to do in the way that she would want me to do it. Uh, she happened to be somebody who, for example, didn't believe in the death penalty. And so, um, and, and her, her answer, her, her answer when we asked her about it was just simply that, uh, that, you know, God don't want you to kill people. And, and, and so uh, that was enough for me. Um, uh, in terms of police brutality and, and being a police officer, she was very proud that I chose to be a police officer. And I really didn't, I really didn't choose to be a police officer. It was something that uh, a friend of mine challenged me to do, uh, 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 a guy by the name of Danny Freeman. He was on the force and then left after I joined. Uh, but he uh uh, he wasn't getting along on the force, and I and 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 after I joined, I figured out why he didn't get along because I was barely getting along with him myself. But I I wasn't going to allow them to run me away. I was going to uh, uh, have it my way. They they say it that way. Uh, I, I just had a particular belief in terms of how to provide service to uh, our people and our community, and I went about the business of doing it. It wasn't always all right with everybody, but. I didn't go there to, to try to please uh, people that I work with. I went there to work for the citizens of the District of Columbia. And that's how I went about doing my work. Um, it, policing was um, policing was something for me that uh, reminded me of the military. Uh, I served in the, I served in the US Air Force for five and a half years. So I'm a Vietnam veteran. Um, I saw a lot of things in the service, uh, uh, racism, discrimination firsthand. Uh, I know when uh, I got hurt in Vietnam and when I went to Japan, I had a chance to, uh, um, uh, my injury was to my arm. So we used to, uh, we would leave the base and on the weekend and check into uh, the local um, um, hotel-like environment on the base and then go to Antam. And uh, I remember going to orientation and the base commander conducted orientation and he actually told us that there were places that black GIs couldn't go to. Now this was in 67 or 68 when I was uh, there. And, uh, and I didn't believe him, but he said we couldn't, but there was a place we could go out the back gate and so, uh, uh, being the kind of person that I didn't believe that that the U.S. Air Force was supporting segregation in, in in that period of time, and so my roommate and I we went out the front gate and went to the clubs, and they called the a they called the air police on us and put us out and told us where we could go. Uh, so when I when I went back to the base on that Monday, checked back in. I had to go see the base commander. And, and he was uh, telling us that what we did was wrong. We couldn't do that. And I, was, I asked him the question, when did the Air Force support? When did the US Air Force support segregation? And so he said, we're not in America, we're in Japan. But I venture to say that 
what was going on in Japan was learned from people from America because there wasn't segregation. I don't believe that there was there was segregation of the races in Japan prior to the U.S. people being there. Because I experienced it in Vietnam too. So, and that's, uh, and, that's my, and that segregation carried over to law enforcement. Oh yeah, yeah. It was. Um, uh, I, I went on in 1970, and in conversations I used to have with Chief of Police uh, Isaac Fullwood, uh, the Metropolitan, the Metropolitan Police Department, and other police departments in America was desegregated in 1969. Prior to that, black police officers couldn't work with white police officers. Uh, black police officers couldn't arrest white people uh, because they wasn't equal. Uh, black police officers could only work in black areas and they could only arrest black people. So uh, segregation and racism uh, is a, a part of uh, policing uh, as much as apple pie is to America. I, I remember, Ron, I grew up in Baltimore and my neighbor across the street, everybody celebrated. The Baltimore American celebrated when he became the first black officer on the Baltimore K-9 force. Then about a month later, there was another article where he turned loose the dog on bank robbers. But the dog had only been trained to attack black people. And so the dog, confused, turned around and attacked him. <laughs> Story. So it sort of points out the history right. of law enforcement in this country in terms of who people are trained to protect and what right. policies are put in place for what reason. Can you comment on that a little bit more? Yes, sir. Uh as a matter of fact, I, I, I was involved in a situation at the uh, UDC when I was there as a, a fellow in the law enforcement. The, um, I, was, I, I was teaching and doing some research uh, at the uh, Institute for Public Safety and Justice under Dr. Sylvia Hill, who's retired now. And one of the things that we were doing, we were conducting court ordered sensitivity and diversity training. So my portion of the training had to do with something that I call uh, looking into the mirror. And this, the training was, was, uh, was for uh, uh, police recruits. Uh, we started at the police academy, but that quickly changed because we couldn't get their attention at the police academy. So we were able to convince them at the police department to send them to the university. It was a three-day training and all of that. They were sitting in the classroom at the academy all rigid and wouldn't say nothing, wouldn't respond to questions and all of that. And so that, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to have them there. But fast forward, well, we're in a class one day and I'm talking to the class about the, the racial overtones of only shooting at black targets. In the firearms training, the targets are black. They're not white. It's not a mobile training. It's not a, a virtual training. It's a training where you stand behind a pole or a wooden a barrier and you shoot at a black target. And so I was sharing with the students in the training some research that was done on that and some of the realities of being trained to shoot at this black shaded target. And um, uh, 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 it went on and come to find out uh, uh, one of the captains over at the training academy uh, found out that I was talking about this. And so she came over and sat in my class while I was talking to these students about the black shaded targets. And I was also uh, 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 telling her and the students about the fact that a lot of police departments had moved away from that kind of training because of the racial implications of just only shooting at black targets and the and the implications of it as it relates to who you think uh, are the criminals as well as who you think uh, deserves to be uh, shot. And uh, they were very concerned about that. 
and uh, had asked uh, uh, Dr. Hill and Dr. Flowers, who were uh, uh, sort of over the over the training uh, methodologies and and what we were doing, and uh, they wanted me to uh, they wanted they wanted me to explain myself and why I did that. I told them I didn't have any problem whatsoever. So I I had to write a statement and quote some research and some some of the uh, research that had been conducted that yield this kind of information, but I also got a chance to provide some information about some more progressive and ways of training individuals when it comes to firearms. But unfortunately, the Metropolitan Police Department still uses the same old-fashioned uh, draconian method of training uh, officers when it comes to firearms, but shooting at those kind of black, pa black shade uh, uh, paper targets. Uh, but those are the kind of things that, that that we do. I know when we were, uh, uh, as a police officer working here in Washington, D.C., I worked in the 3rd District. And sometimes uh, on the midnight shift, uh, my district would share a radio with the 2nd District. And then we would hear other districts on the radio. We actually uh, would hear, um, uh, I remember working when I first went on, and a black officer coming on working in the second district, which is Georgetown and Upper Northwest on the Connecticut Avenue, Wisconsin Avenue side, and where he had gotten up, he had received a run to respond to a burglary. And when he got to the burglary, he evidently he got out of his car, went and knocked on the door. And and the woman wanted him to come around to the back door. <laughs> he came back and got in his car and drove off and went back in service and he told the dispatcher that the woman wanted him to come to the back door and he wasn't going to no back doors. So uh, all of that was because of the color of his skin. So, you know, uh, it, it, it it was still very, very relevant and in the Metropolitan Police Department at the time that I joined, uh, the force happened to be only about 19% uh, African-American and we had less women than we did Blacks on the police force. I remember in 1972, when there was a lawsuit that was filed, a national lawsuit that impacted policing as it relates to women to allow them to work with men and work on the street. Prior to that, women could not work, black or white, women could not work with men, nor could they ride in police cars. They were only limited to working in the police station or in the in the in the female section of the jail or something like that, or working with youth, but they couldn't work with men. And so uh, there's a lot of things that we were able to witness in terms of the transformation of policing. Brother Hampton, I want to get into a subject that created some tension, which was when folks heard the slogan abolish or defund the police. Okay. People were running around screaming that slogan. <laughs> uh, and I know that we had a split instantly in my congregation. Okay. Of folks who agreed. And my senior citizens going, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> right? We need police protection. Right. And the thing was, was that it seems to me that a slogan was created without the education behind it. And that confused a whole lot of people with people who basically have a simplistic view and talk about sort of uh, defund the police without talking about what that means. Right. And basically people who are vulnerable and feeling unprotected in the community, feeling like that would create a greater crisis on their lives. Now, I know you said the police cannot be reformed. I don't believe they can. <laughs> so take us further down that road. Down <laughs> that <Yes. route. laughs> I, I, I don't think they can because that's what we've been doing ever since the professional era was ushered into policing. We've been reforming policing. And the professional era was a time in policing where they went from uh, uh, promotion and hiring by virtue, I know you. Like like they like they did for a long time when it came to jobs in the fire department. 
mm-hmm. and like promotion in mm-hmm. the service. It, we we there's a history of promotions in the service being that the captain would come out and after some uh, soldier uh, uh, was involved in some heroic event, then he would get promoted to sergeant, lieutenant, or captain. Uh, then wasn't merit wasn't an uh, issue. Well, a lot of times in the early policing was like that also, but ushered in the professional era. And so then we started having testing for certain things, uh, merit testing, performance, and all those kinds of things. So we've been in a perform in a reforming era for some now for some time. And I, I really want to say that I probably think that it's close to a hundred years that we've been involved in reforming police. Uh <laughs> Let me touch on the issue of training too. I, I think if there's a if there's a, a uh, if there's a job in America that I think where people is uh, overtrained, it's probably in policing. Every time something happens, somebody in policing says, "Well, let's train them, and then they'll be all right. Let's provide some training." And 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 my record shows that. Even though we keep doing that, they keep committing the same infractions over and over again. So I'm not someone who thinks that they ought to be trained. I'm tired of training. Uh, I don't think that reform has worked. If you would, if you would for a minute, go back to Rodney King in 1971, when Rodney King was beaten. And if you remember why he was beaten, how he was beaten, and where he was beaten, that's not very different than what happened in Memphis last year. The only thing that might be a little difference is, is that the, the people who beat the brother in Memphis is all black. And I think there was only one or two blacks in the beating that took place in Rodney King in 91. So, and we've been, if we just looked at that alone, that their reforming has been a part of that process all along. Uh, we even had some, uh, uh, neither one of those issues was the first time that we've had African-American or Hispanic people, men and women involved in beating uh, black folk. Uh, my tenure on the Metropolitan Police Department, I was involved in the, at least two incidents where I reported uh, officers for uh, physical force. And in and, and both of those uh, situations, there were black and white officers involved in it, as well as the cover up. So that's not the issue. Let me let me talk a little bit about the fund. I, I'm not so sure. I know they didn't think about it. I think the fund is an excellent uh, term if you want people to panic. And the ones that panicked was the ones who have been, uh, there were two people I think that that panicked and that was white America and black folk who drank the Kool-Aid. And the Kool-Aid I'm talking about is the one that believed that somehow or another that the police in this country was created to protect you. And that's not what policing in America was created for. They was they was created to protect property and to protect uh, a property, but also uh, involved in the slave catching, uh, 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 doing slavery. And the latter was first. But later on, black folk have not benefited from it. Uh, that, that it reminds me of uh, that crazy governor in Florida who says that black folk uh, have benefited from slavery. So when someone said that black folk have benefited from having the police force, I think about the same thing. They haven't benefited from it. They've been victimized by it in most of the areas. If it hasn't been personal, it's their community and neighborhoods have been victimized. So all we had to do is look at the war on drugs our community was pilgrimed. Uh, our people was taken. Uh, mass incarceration was created during the war on drugs. 
and and white folk was doing the same thing at the same level that black folk was doing it, but black folk paid for it. And I believe that the new that the even the move to decriminalize drugs, all drugs, is a white move. It's not a black move. It's a white move. But black folk have paid for it all these years. Now, I'm someone who I can understand the defund, but to me, defund mean evaluation and analysis of the function that police provide in our society. And, and through that thorough analysis and evaluation, if there have been assigned a particular task and they're not conducting that task in an efficient and effective way, it needs to be taken away from them. We, we on a regular basis, evaluate and analyze government, but we never evaluate and analyze policing in the way of all the money that we invest in policing. And yet we get very little return on our dollars. So to me, the defund movement was very timely and appropriate when we talk about the task of public safety and policing in our society. See, I'm for taking about 10 things from policing that we traditionally, and, and I don't even want to say traditionally, that they have been given, say, over the last 20 or 25 years. Because there was a time when they didn't respond to domestic violence. There was a time when they didn't respond to calls for mental health. There was a time when they didn't respond to calls dealing with youth. There was a time that they didn't respond to calls to take the dog or cat out of the tree. The police did not respond to those calls. During the community policing era, police leaders said, we can take that job and we can do it in a proactive way. And then that way, because we're the most visible arm of government that works 24 hours a day, we can do those kind of things in a proactive, preventive kind of way and then download those responsibilities from other government agencies. There was even a, I mean, there was a, really a time when we just had one 911 and then we downloaded 911 to 311 because we wanted to take those tasks and then distribute them because the police being the people that responded to it, then they could, then they could refer people to other agencies and other services so they could get those services. What has happened over this period of time is, is that the police, the public safety function in our society has proven that they cannot do none of that. And so yeah, our job ought to be to take that away from them and then give it back to the professionals. Uh, public health and the Department of Behavioral Health ought to be the people who respond directly to people who are having mental health episodes. And the police can be called because if a person goes to school for eight years and learns how to handle someone who's having a mental health episode, we ought to let them do it. And we ought to let them decide whether or not the police are needed. And there are uh, pilot projects and programs going on right now all over the United States and they're very successful. The police should not be responding to calls for domestic violence because they don't handle those calls. That 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 uh, mandatory arrest policy that came out of a, 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 a case in, in, I was even in Minneapolis or Minnesota, has created nothing but problems since the police have been given that responsibility. We know that they shouldn't be responding to calls for service related to youth. So there's about five, six, maybe eight things that the police have no business doing that we don't get our, excuse the expression, our bang for our buck, but yet public safety demands the largest percentage of our money as it relates to our uh, city and state budgets. And it's no longer, we no longer ought to be investing in something that does not serve us well. And certainly from the black community perspective. You reinforced my position and that is- No, please, you go ahead first. And that is that we created a slogan without the education. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in a sense, in fighting and boxing, we talk about 
leading with Al Chen. Right. Led with Al Chen. And got the daylights knocked out of us because the education wasn't there. One of our participants, John Shuford, he raises this, he says, we have trained correctional officers in emotional intelligence skills and it transformed the work culture in very positive ways. Do you think that could be done with the police? Uh, well, I, I don't really think so because we've done some similar kind of things with police. Uh, we have. I, I think everything over the last hundred years, I don't I don't know of anything that we haven't tried to train our police to do. And what has happened is, is that one or two of the individuals have been successfully have successfully navigated whatever it was that we was trying to train them. But that's an individual. That isn't an institution response. Institutionally, we have they it has not worked. And I don't know, I don't know what we have to do to try something different. And the different thing is, is that for me, the difference is is to let professionals who have been trained and educated, because training and education are different who have been trained and educated to handle these situations, let them handle the situations and really reduce down the responsibility of the police to something that has to do with what they can do. Yeah. Ariel, you were going to ask a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Over the years, you um, advocated strongly for community policing. Do you still uh, think that there is hope in that? Um, is it possible to get back to that in a way that um, works? For uh, I, I think it is, but there's a word of caution. There's a word of caution. Uh, community policing, from the creators of community policing, uh, Tajinovich and Bonnie Buccaneer and all of them at Michigan State and Lansing talked about community policing from as a, a philosophical model that where the police were in the neighborhood, got to get to know the people, uh, get to know the neighborhood, the ins and outs of the community and all of that. And also responded to the very issues of the things that were going on in the neighborhood in a proactive way. What has happened is, is that when the military model of policing came along versus, I, I see the community policing model as similar to the guardian model. But when the military model of policing came along, it was the answer to the prayers of the people in the policing community because they had wanted that all along. Too many of the the, the too many of the stalwarts of the policing community berated community policing because it was it called for a partnership between the police and the community, which the partnership was heavily weighted on the community side. And the police did not believe that the community was educated enough to tell them or influence the job that they was doing. So it was an unbalanced relationship. But when the military model came along, not only just in terms of how they talked about it, how they dressed, how they performed, and the, and and down to the trinkets that they wore on their uniform. We're not doing the police department. The chief of police wore an signature badge. He didn't have no four stars on his on his epaulet. What does four stars on your epaulet remind you of? It's the military. A general in the military. Two stars was boy must a major general. One star is the it's a it is a a, a a a brigadier general and all that kind of stuff. Three stars is a lieutenant general. The whole thing, uh, the person who heads up the precinct is called a commander. Those are military terms, and policing is not a military thing. And the whole military model coming on. The, the backside of community policing 
meant that the police could just do away with the community policing model because they were very hesitant about it in the first place because it calls for them to get to know their community and be a part of it. And, and that was something that they were pushing back on from the very beginning. In the places where they were successful in implementation and carrying out the model, there were places where that took place, but they were smaller communities where uh, as well as smaller police departments where they were really at the ground level in terms of working together. But in these major police departments, they were just flirting with it. And nor was there any really, I believe, sincere effort to really carry it out in the way that Tajinovich and Buccaneer and all of them really talked about it and visualized how it would work. All right. And as um, Ron, um, Ellen um, Barfield, one of our participants, she says, yes, Ron, in the 1033 program of surplus or equipment to police forces, the public are not enemies. And um, so, um, you know, I, know, I think we all see every time we have some adventure overseas with war, the police departments end up with that surplus equipment being distributed back into their forces. And what happens? Surplus equipment don't just remain on the shelf. No. Surplus equipment is used. And in this case then, used against the public uh, as <laughs> so-called viable. Yeah. LA, LA was a perfect example of it. Uh, they have personal carriers, personnel carriers, uh, I, I, when I was on the police force, I actually, I actually held this uh, thing in my hand, and I know that there are other departments who have used it where you could uh, 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 shine this thing at a wall, and you could tell if people were on the other side of the wall. Now, th that that now there may be there may be a time where that kind of information or that kind of technology would be valuable, but uh most of the time in municipal policing in our cities and communities and neighborhoods uh i don't really think that that stuff has uh, uh a practical use uh if you were to look at the tasks that police officers respond to i would say 80 to 80 5% of the work that police officers do uh, is responding to calls for service and working in the community. I would say that less than 10% of it is about, uh, you know, cops and robbers, uh, guns and, and robberies and, and that particular side of it. But if when you look at contemporary policing, the reverse is, is the way that they live. Uh, I, I I was involved in some conversation with some people in the training here recently at a conference, and the and the lady and the the guy that was talking to us was talking about that policing was was the one of the most dangerous jobs on the universe. And so you know I know the answer to that. So I I asked him. I said, Well, do you really know what the most dangerous job on the universe is? And so. They looked at me real strange, and I said, "Well, the most dangerous job in the universe is a truck driver, and 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 policing is number fourteen on that list." So, and, and I don't have a problem with the job being characterized as being dangerous because there's a dangerous component of it. But that's the purpose of training and education to reduce the the danger portion of it. But we also ought to be looking at, for example, and I said to them, we ought to be looking at to what extent officers contribute to their own demise. To what level do they contribute to it because of the machoism and the other stuff that goes along with the, the, the how the job is characterized. What we ought to do, I believe, is be real about the fact that I know when I went through training, they didn't tell me to jump out and run into places. They said, get down behind a car or behind some kind of structure to protect yourself. So 
it's just is I believe in talking and being honest about it, but let's not let's not let's not uh build it up in a way that uh, uh that when you're talking about it, it's a lie because it's not the most dangerous job out there. I wonder, you spoke about the roots of policing being in white supremacy, and I imagine everybody on this call is familiar with that. But if you could talk about uh, white supremacy within the, or white Christian nationalism as well as before is working on that within the current police force, um, where it shows up and if there are attempts to address and root it out. Well, I think I, I think it shows up in the systemic nature of uh, as racism does in the institutions and and uh, in our in, in our society. It it isn't because 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 it has such a powerful there's a there's a very powerful pushback on it uh, a, as in other institutions. But the fact of the matter is that it's present there. Um, we have seen it. Uh, for example, when I joined the police department, as I was saying, it was about 19% African American. Uh, over the years, I've seen it go up to almost 60% here in the District of Columbia. But we happen to be on a downward swing now because we're losing those Black officers who came on during that particular time because they have, they are at the age and stage of their retirement. But the, the system isn't replacing African-American officers with African-American officers. Most of the, a lot of the officers that are looking to uh, law enforcement for, for careers are white officers who want to come into the system. African-American officers, African-American people, young people aren't looking at uh, the job of policing and uh, a lot of the things that's going on in our society around policing has turned a lot of black young people off when we look at policing, also Hispanics. Yes. They're just not looking at policing uh, for careers. But but the, the, the racism and the, and, and the discrimination in law enforcement, I mean, we just had this year, we just had 10 black women sue the Metropolitan Police Department for not not only sexism and racism, but hostile work environment and a whole lot of other things. And so some of the stuff is very subtle because you can't openly and and, 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 and boldly practice racism and discrimination because they, you're going to get called on it. But those systems have not changed. They have been driven deeper into the system. But when you disturb those comfortable uh, areas of the institution of the, of the police department, then you're going to get you're going to get pushed back from it. Um, it has happened, and we haven't uh, uh, we we just haven't seen the, the kind of um, e equal distribution across the issue. Say, for example, uh, arrests. We're still black folk in this city are still getting arrested as if they make up 100% of the city when we right. know white commit crime too. It's still happening. Sure. Uh, look at our, look at the juvenile justice system. I, I, it's a juvenile justice system. Uh, and when Vincent Sorelli was here as uh, looking at our system, the youth system, he even published and started the, the, uh, the uh, practice of publishing a yearly report on who in the youth and who in youth are being incarcerated. And, and this juvenile, our system has never ever had a white youth in the system. We have never had a white youth when it was old uh, down there in Maryland. Now, now it's called New Beginnings and we've never had a white youth in that system. And, and I know for a fact that youth commit crime in the city, that it just happens to be handled very differently than when young black youths commit crime. And the, and, and the community, the situations are very different. My um, colleague and friend and leader, the Reverend Dr. Wanda Thompson, she asked you the question. She's the pastor of Ambassador Baptist Church here in Washington, D.C. 
Mm-hmm. And she asked the question, who do you feel should be recruited as police, if anyone? Well, the, the person that I think ought to be recruited for policing is the individual who is well-rounded, educated, aware of the history of policing in this in America, and uh, and 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 on that on on that side, that's the individual, but the the institution itself, I believe, has to change. It, it needs to be re- renewed, and and what I mean by that is is that the young people who are looking for jobs now are very different than when I was looking for a job in 1970. And in order to attract those young people to this, this, to the job of being a police officer, then we need to talk with them and find out what it is that they think policing should be and how should it be situated. But the policing system itself hasn't changed in 150 years in this country, where most institutions and organizations have changed, if not significantly. So, and, and, and so police departments, like, like our police department, for example, it's hard, it's, it has a desire to hire people and they're giving them $25,000 to come on board and they have to sign a two year commitment. $25,000 and they must sign a two year commitment. So the question that I have for them, every time I get a chance to talk to them is, how much are you, how much bonus are you giving teachers? Because we need teachers. And in my book, teachers are more important than police. We need social, we need social workers. How much are you, how, how what kind of bonus are you paying people to come on as social workers? Because we need social workers. Amen. As a matter of fact, there's a young man who's a mayor in Newark, New Jersey. He realized that he needed police, but he wanted to change the paradigm. So for every two police he hires, he hires a social worker. And a uh, and a uh, a social worker and a and a counselor, the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, because we're we're not going to hire police and then police are going to get us out of this situation that we're in. So we need to have some other professional people who can really address the issues that exist in our the foundation of the problems in our community. The police have have proven that they they're not going to do that. Over the, over the years, there was a subtle sociological shift, and that was in D.C. They did a policy change that said that you could apply to be a police officer if you had two years of college yeah. or was honorably discharged from the military. Right. So in other words, if you were somebody coming out of high school that had a commitment to your community, and needed a job, you couldn't apply unless you had students to get two years of college or go in the right. middle and come back home. And that effectively got DC natives out of the Metropolitan Police Department. And that so was you, Charles Ramsey. That was Charles Ramsey right. who wanted that. Yeah, that's what that was. And you, saw the, and you see this decline today in yeah. terms of people of color on the Metropolitan Police Department. Yeah. See, I, I don't, I, I make no mistake about it. I think formal education is very important. But I'm not so sure that formal education ought to be a prerequisite to be a police officer. Now, there's some other things that I could think of before I think about formal education. And for Black people, I, I mentioned early on in the conversation that there was this guy who was a, a professor at Howard University who conducted this study during my time back in the 70s of uh, Blacks and formal education and police work because there was this notion going on that, and in, in back in my day, all you had to have was a high school diploma or a, a GED. But there was, there was, there was a lot of Black folk in the Metropolitan Police Department and nationally who had degrees, had gone to college. Uh, some had gone before, some had gone while they were on the job. And 
the, the, the notion was that formal education would help them get promoted and help them promote and then move throughout the system of policing. But this, this, this professor found out that at the time that he conducted the study in Washington, D.C., about 70-some percent, close to 80 percent of the Blacks that was on the Metropolitan Police Department had degrees. But a college degree is no, is, is, is in no way uh, 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 is a substitute, it, it is, uh, will fight against racism. And it was systemic racism and discrimination that was holding Blacks back on the Metropolitan Police Department, not that they had a college degree. Now, and Black folk had a college degree where white folk didn't have a college degree because they, they didn't need to have a college degree because it was their system. It was their system that allowed them to do it. They could just do it. They could just join. And as a matter of fact, that's what they were. And they was getting promoted, moving up the ranks, but black folk with degrees wasn't moving and getting and, and getting promoted. And it took the first our first black chief of police, Bertel Jefferson. It took him to get appointed mayor. I mean, get appointed police chief during under Mayor Walter Washington that started blacks moving in the system because he was able to move blacks around. He made some changes in the promotional process that allowed them to be a, allowed him to move people, but allowed them to be able to move in the promotional process too. So whether or not you had a college degree didn't mean anything. What, what we had to deal with was the racism and discrimination that, that permeated the system that was preventing us from move. But let, let me say this about today. See, I, I think one of the reasons that I think that stalls too is, is that If you're going to have a college degree, and if I'm going to go on the police to force, and I got a college degree, I've been to college, and I'm going to join the police force, I want to know what value does my college degree have at the police department? Because I'm, I got I to gotta be a police officer to work on the street, and I had to work on the street a certain amount of years before I can even take the test to get promoted. And then what value does my degree has in the promotional process. If I wanted to change and go to a different division, what value does my degree have in assisting and helping me get to another place in the police department? How does it help me move up? See, because we haven't eliminated <clears throat> some of the structural barriers in this paramilitary system that, that pushes back sometime on formal education, but promotes the idea that you have a certain amount of experience. And the experience is not whether you've been to college or not, the experience right. is how many years you've been in patrol or how many years you've been uh, a sergeant or some stuff like that. Yep. So once we work those kind of things out, and, th and let me throw in again, see, I think our police departments would benefit from, and not just the one here in Washington, but nationally, this whole notion that to have some conversation with some young people about how do they see policing today? What is it that they would be interested in? How would they go about handling some of these situations? Because if, 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 if some other institutions in our society have been successful with retooling what they do and how they go about doing it, as well as attracting these young people to the workplace, then the police need to do it because they're not getting it. Also, when you compare policing in America to some of the foreign police departments, the places like England and Canada, they go to a police college and then come out with a four-year degree. Say, we're, almost, we're almost out of time. Ariel, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanna invite in on for our last question, if we can get him to unmute. Uh, FOR member and uh, my friend Vincent, um, whose daughter's mother uh, was killed by the police in uh, Rockland County, which is where FOR's um, offices are located. And Vincent, you said you had a question and welcome. Yeah. Hey, welcome. Welcome everybody. First of all, I can say for all the speakers and you, Ariel and stuff, you wrong absolutely is amazing for everything they do. I just wanted to say real quick to you, Ron, that 
My daughter's name was Tina Davis, and her mother, her mother was murdered by the Spring Valley Police Department. She was tased to death. And it was one of the most, she was brain dead. We had to pull the plug on her. And, you know, the cover up was so hard and so tremendous, you know, behind the police department and stuff. And everybody closed a lot of doors. I just wanted to say for a moment, the only door that was open to me and my family was FOR. And, you know, for what you talk about and what you fight for and stuff and the rev you to and stuff and anything else, I got to say it's amazing. Keep it up. I just, but I just had to say that about FOR because the pain that we experienced and still are, FOR was there every step of the way. I just, wanted to, I just had to say that for a few seconds. I'm sorry if I talk over the limit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bless See, you. I, I, let, me, let me say this. One of, one of the things that often comes to my mind is, is that I try to pay attention to stuff. And there are a couple of things that, that the behavior of individuals, but that's very different than when you have a situation like Rodney King, uh, the one that was in Louisville, Kentucky with the young lady, uh, uh, George Floyd, uh, the brother in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And what, and, and what we see, those are to me institutional problems. And, and I'm gonna tell you the difference. The difference is, is that when you, when the cover up is involved, see if, it's, if, if something happened in an accident and we can see it, but when something happened, and the cover up is involved. There's a tape of it. There's also a written statement, but the tape and the written statement does not jive. There are two different things, two different uh, uh, stories about it. Then one has to real, one has to accept the notion. I believe that this is a normal occurrence that it, if it takes place in the police department and that they are allowed to cover it up as though nothing has happened or for some reason, then they make up the story or the situation that allows them to be able to do it. Yes, yes. Ron, I want to thank you for your time and I want to thank everybody for their time. And I really, as I sum it up, I want to thank our executive director, Ariel Gold, for her continued vision and particularly, we're moving towards a conference in the spring. And that conference is going to deal with guns, God, and Christian nationalism. And we hope to hold it in Atlanta and maybe have some actions against Cop City while we're down there. But I want to thank uh, our executive director and others for helping give that vision. And Ron, I want to call on you particularly to help us convene a table of law enforcement, current and former law enforcement, that can talk about these issues around how we move forward and create an atmosphere that is more just, more equitable, and gets free of racism and white supremacy. So I hope to call on you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody.